Here we're beginning a rather long unit on the chemistry of the carbonyl group and carbonyl compounds. And this is a vast area because the carbonyl group is both extremely important and extremely ubiquitous in organic and bioorganic chemistry. It's a carbon-oxygen double bond. That makes it an electron withdrawing group and that, that has interesting effects on atoms that the carbonyl group is attached to. And it makes the carbon of the CO double bond strongly electrophilic and the oxygen a decent nucleophile and decent base. So here we'll look at a general overview of the carbonyl group and carbonyl compounds. First, distinguishing between carbon-based carbonyl compounds, ketones and aldehydes, and what are called carboxylic acid derivatives, which incorporate a heteroatom. And then we'll move into more specific reactions of carbonyl compounds in future lessons. And here, really, the focus will be on mechanism, primarily in a laboratory context. But keep in mind that we're going to draw analogies between the laboratory reactions we see here and biochemical applications that we'll see in the future. The carbonyl group is everywhere in biochemistry. It appears in the amino acids, the carboxylic acid functional group, carbohydrates as an aldehyde or ketone, and in a variety of other places. So the chemistry we're going to learn here is really foundational for the remainder of the semester. Let's dive right in with the structure and nomenclature of carbonyl compounds. The carbonyl group is a carbon-oxygen double bond. It's really as simple as that. This bond is polarized toward oxygen, of course, because oxygen is more electronegative than carbon, so we see partial negative charge on the oxygen and partial positive charge on the carbon atom. The oxygen atom bears two non-bonding lone pairs, and the geometry of the carbonyl carbon is trigonal planar, as we would expect from simple Vesper theory considerations. This carbon is also sp2 hybridized. Notice that it has three electron groups around it. Now, there's an alternative resonance form of the carbonyl group that's very important to consider. And we generate this resonance form by essentially pushing the CO pi electrons toward the more electronegative atom in the carbonyl group, the oxygen. This generates the structure that you see on the left with now three non-bonding lone pairs at the carbonyl oxygen and a positive formal charge at the carbonyl carbon. And this resonance structure really reveals two things about the reactivity of the carbonyl group. The first is that the carbonyl oxygen has the potential to act as a base or a nucleophile. It's relatively electronegative, so it's not as basic as, say, an amine, but nonetheless, it has the capacity to act as a base or nucleophile. And here I label it decent. It's not great, but it is worth keeping in mind. The second thing that this resonance form reveals that's really important is that the carbonyl carbon is an excellent electrophile. The positive formal charge that you see in this resonance structure on the left is really just an extreme representation of the fact that this carbon has partial positive charge in the true structure of the carbonyl group. And that partial positive charge or full positive charge within the resonance form is very important to keep in mind. The carbonyl group is one of the most important electrophiles in organic chemistry. It's right up there with alkyl halides as one of the most important electrophiles. Now here, we're thinking about carbonyl groups sort of in isolation, connected, for example, to maybe two hydrogens or two saturated alkyl groups. But heteroatom substituted carbonyl groups are also important to consider. And in these, we've got a heteroatom typically with a lone pair connected to the carbonyl group. These structures are resonance active because they contain a good electron source in the form of a non-bonding lone pair on the heteroatom adjacent to a good electron sink, the carbon-oxygen pi antibond. And so we can draw a resonance form in which the heteroatom has formal positive charge and the oxygen formal negative charge. This alternative resonance form of these heteroatom-substituted carbonyl groups really, really reveals two things that distinguish these compounds from the simpler carbon and hydrogen-substituted compounds we were considering above. The first is the enhanced basicity of the carbonyl. If the heteroatom is a good electron donating group, something like NR2 and OR, electron density will be pushed onto the carbonyl oxygen. And this increases its basicity, and the negative formal charge on this resonance form is good evidence of that. The other effect that this resonance form has is attenuated electrophilicity at the carbonyl carbon. Again, if the X atom is a good electron donating group, the donation of electrons toward the carbonyl carbon makes that carbon less likely and less desiring, in a sense, to accept electrons. That makes it a weaker electrophile than the carbonyl carbon in something with only hydrogen or carbon connected to the carbonyl carbon.
This additional important resonance form causes profound differences in the reactivity of these heteroatom substituted carbonyl groups relative to those containing only carbon or hydrogen linked to the carbonyl group. And so we think about them separately as two different classes of carbonyl compounds. The heteroatom substituted carbonyl compounds are referred to as carboxylic acid derivatives. And those that contain only carbon or hydrogen linked to the carbonyl carbon will refer to as ketohydes. These two classes have different enough properties in reactivity that we're going to think about them separately in a number of contexts. The carbonyl group is a classic example of a class of structures called electron withdrawing groups, or EWGs. And electron withdrawing groups are pretty much exactly that. Groups, collections of atoms that withdraw or pull electron density from attached pi systems. And this concept of an attached pi system we'll take a look at in a couple of examples below. But the basic idea of every electron withdrawing group is the same. They all fit the same general structural pattern shown here. They all consist of an atom X connected to an atom Y that's more electronegative than X. This creates a polarization within this bond, and it's always a double or triple bond since the withdrawing effect occurs through the pi system. Because Y is more electronegative than X, the XY multiple bond is polarized towards Y, meaning X is partially positive and Y partially negative. And if we take this idea to an extreme, we can draw a resonance structure derived from pushing electrons to Y to make X formally positively charged and Y formally negatively charged. And it's really this full positive charge in the resonance form and the partial positive charge in the actual structure that explains the electron withdrawing effect of the group. This X atom can accept electron density from an attached pi system, and usually we see this through resonance structures derived from electron flow from the pi system toward X through the creation of a bond between X and the atom X is connected to, typically a carbon. On a deeper level, electron withdrawing groups work by altering the energies of the pi molecular orbitals of the attached pi system. Specifically, they lower the energy of the lowest unfilled pi molecular orbital of the attached pi system. And this makes the system a stronger electrophile and more likely to accept electrons, or if you like, less likely to donate electrons. It's also made a weaker nucleophile. And we typically illustrate this by drawing resonance structures in which positive charge appears within the attached pi system. So as an example, let's imagine benzene, a classic cyclic pi system, connected to a general electron withdrawing group. In fact, let's use the carbonyl, our prototypical example, to illustrate this kind of electron flow. The carbonyl group is electron withdrawing because oxygen is more electronegative than carbon, and we've seen electron flow like this to generate an important resonance form of the carbonyl group. But we can couple this resonance electron flow to movement of pi electrons from benzene as well. This is because the benzene pi system is directly attached to the carbonyl carbon. In the resulting resonance structure, the carbonyl oxygen has become negatively charged, and we're used to this from the prototypical resonance form of just the bare carbonyl group. But in addition, we've placed positive charge within the benzene ring. And it's this positive charge that we see within the attached pi system, within the benzene ring, that we use to explain the stronger electrophilicity of this carbonyl substituted benzene system relative to an electron neutral benzene, where, for example, we replace the carbonyl group with hydrogen. Examples of electron withdrawing groups abound. Really, the prototypical example, and the one that's most important for us, is the carbonyl group. Notice that it fits the general pattern, an XY multiple bond where X, carbon, is less electronegative than Y oxygen. There's also a nitrogen analog of the carbonyl group that we'll take a detailed look at in a future series of videos, and this is called an imine, and you'll hear me refer to the imine as a glorified carbonyl group for fairly obvious reasons. Like the carbonyl group, it consists of a carbon attached to a more electronegative atom, in this case nitrogen, via a double bond, and so it fits the pattern of the electron withdrawing group again. And we can think about, for example, pushing electrons up to the imino nitrogen. One of the strongest electron withdrawing groups, one that I'm fond of calling the granddaddy of them all, is the nitro group, which consists of an NO double bond 
and an NO single bond such that the central nitrogen atom is formally positively charged. Notice that if we ignore this other O minus group, the NO double bond fits the general pattern. We have a nitrogen connected to a more electronegative atom, oxygen, by a multiple bond. Yet another example is the triple bond analog of the imine, in which instead of having this R group here and this R group here, carbon and nitrogen are linked by a triple bond, and this is referred to as the cyano or the nitrile group. Finally, we can imagine a sulfur atom connected to oxygen via one or two double bonds, and both of these are electron withdrawing groups. Two double bonds is a sulfone or the sulfonyl group, and one double bond is associated with the sulfoxide, and we've seen these functional groups before in the context of the oxidation of sulfide. And so in aryl and alkenyl sulfones and sulfoxides, this SO2 or SO group is an important electron withdrawing group. And just to really drive the analogy between all of these structures home, notice that in all of them, we can imagine an important resonance form in which we push electrons up to the more electronegative atom in the multiple bond while withdrawing electrons from the attached pi system. This kind of resonance electron flow really provides us with a concrete basis for understanding the changes in orbital energy and especially the change in lowest unoccupied orbital energy that comes along with the attachment of an electron withdrawing group to a pi system. And while the carbonyl group is our main point of focus here, one of the reasons I'm showing all of these examples is to encourage you to make analogies between what we learn about the carbonyl group and the chemistry of these other related groups, especially the amine, nitrile, and sulfonyl and sulfoxide groups.